Hi. This is the LaunchKey Mini Mark III, Novation's most portable and least expensive controller. And it's quite an upgrade from the previous version. The biggest updates are a built-in arpeggiator with a few unique features, a 3.5mm MIDI out so you can use LaunchKey standalone with hardware, not just with a computer, a sustain pedal input, RGB pads, which are very useful if you plan to use this with Ableton Live, a pitch bend and mod strip, broader Ableton Live support, and even a chord mode. In this video, I'll take a look at using LaunchKey Mini Mark III as a standalone hardware controller and arpeggiator to use with your hardware synths, as a controller to use with your DAW, as well as with an iPad. Let's first take a look at the hardware. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is a controller. It doesn't make any sounds on its own. You need to pair it with an instrument like a hardware synth, iPad, or computer. And this in turn will tell it which notes to play or which scenes to launch in the case of Ableton Live. The hardware itself is surprisingly light and made of plastic. Controls are two octaves of velocity sensitive mini keys, 16 velocity sensitive RGB pads, eight knobs, which are pots, not endless encoders, pitch bend and mod wheel, and a few extra control buttons. On the back are a proper USB jack, not one of those micro USB ones for power and for MIDI back and forth with your computer, a sustain pedal input, and a three and a half millimeter MIDI port. I'll explain more about this later. Let's talk about the key bed. The mini keys are obviously smaller and have less travel than a regular size keyboard, but when playing with an instrument, it actually feels quite good and seems like you have pretty good control over what's going on in terms of velocity. The keyboard is velocity sensitive, but it doesn't have aftertouch. Let's talk about the pads. They're more recessed, I think, than previous models and they are velocity sensitive. Let's check them out with drums and with an acoustic instrument as well. So I'll pick a drum track and go into drum mode. So you do have control over velocity. It's not though as fine as with the key bed. I'm not a professional finger drummer, but I think this works well. Aside from the regular drum mode, the pads can also be assigned to any MIDI command that you want. This is the default. Set to a minor scale, you can see that. Again, velocity sensitivity works obviously not as precise as with a keyboard. What I like about this is that they can be treated really as two separate keyboards in one, right? So I can play in this case, you know, transposed, let's say over here. And then what I like about this is that they can be treated really as two separate keyboards in one. So you could set the pads to play a different octave or even a different instrument than what you're playing on the keyboard which is a nice way to escape the two octave limit at a time of the mini keys. I mean, if you use the pads in this scale mode, it's really two octaves in addition to the two octaves you have here. Okay, let's talk about MIDI. The MK3 sends MIDI out its USB port. So if you don't care about regular MIDI cables and hardware other than a computer or iPad, feel free to skip ahead to the arpeggiator section because the next couple of minutes are gonna be a rant about the history of conflicting MIDI standards, which you need to know if you're gonna be using this little three and a half millimeter port. So as you may know, MIDI is a standard with which musical instruments can tell each other which notes to play or which parameters to change, like sweeping a filter. MIDI was originally implemented using these five pin cables, but these connectors are a bit of a scam or at least overkill because only three of the pins are used, at which point someone came along and suggested that since some instruments are getting smaller, why don't we use a three and a half millimeter TRS stereo cable, like these guys, which a lot of people have and just happen to have enough wires through them to carry MIDI, right? So there's a tip, a ring and a sleeve and these three wires are really the only things MIDI needs to send its information. By the way, do not use tip sleeve or TS cables like this one. Right, these are mono, these are stereo, use one of these to make this work. Anyway, this truly great idea wasn't followed up with an industry-wide agreement on which of the three wires running through the three and a half millimeter cable 
would replace the three wires that are used in the five pin cable. The result was that a few manufacturers did it one way and others did it the opposite way, which means devices couldn't speak with each other directly with a cable like this. The MIDI organization called these two standards TRSA and TRSB, which is odd because once there are two versions of something, it's not a standard anymore. But luckily, about a year ago, they had a rethink and decided to go just with TRSA as a standard. Unfortunately, we still have great instruments that use TRSB. Novation, by the way, used to use TRSB up until this keyboard. Going forward, hopefully, they'll commit to TRSA, which is the standard that everybody uses. Hopefully, everybody will jump on the TRSA bandwagon. But the problem is, what happens when you want to have a TRS-A device speak with a TRS-B device? So let's start with a simple use case. If both devices speak TRS-A, you just take a regular headphone, a stereo headphone cable, plug one end into the MIDI output, and then another end into MIDI in. And the beauty of this is that it just works. If you want to connect Launch Key MIDI to one of the devices that has one of these big five pin MIDI jacks, you need a little dongle that supports the TRS-A standard. You then hook these two together, plug this into Launch Key and this into your bigger synth. Now, what happens if you want to get Launch Key Mini to speak with a TRS-B type device? You either get a TRS-B dongle and connect it to the other end of this cable, right? So you've got one dongle on one end and another dongle on the other end. You can chop up a cable like this and cross the streams, so to speak. I'll put a link in the description to how to do that. And if you're into Eurorack, there's a little module like this. This costs almost as much as this and it has other uses, but one of the things that it can do is take TRS A or B and flip the wire for you. So if you take another little cable, plug this into here, and then this guy into here, and I also moved the audio into here. Now, this is a Eurorack module, right? It, it, but it doesn't need to be powered. This whole switch is passive, and like I said, can be done rather easily. Anyway, all that said and done, you can play notes here, or, right, or here. And now you've got a MIDI controller for your TRS-B device. So that's the TRS-A and B mess, and hopefully now everybody who doesn't care about standards has come back and we can talk about the arpeggiator. So Launch Key Mini has a built-in arpeggiator, right? So you don't need a computer to run this arpeggiator. You can connect it just directly to your synths. The only reason I've got USB connected here is just to get power from the computer. You could power this easily with a power brick or your phone charger. So there's an arpeggiator. Let's talk about the different modes that it has. The different modes are written here on top of the keyboard and above the knobs over here. The first thing we wanna do is probably latch it, right? Latch on off. Let's cycle through these quickly. Right, you've got a few modes. As played, random chord, which this doesn't play because it's monophonic. Then mutate, which is cool. We'll get to that later. You've got different rates triplets rates as well. Notice, by the way, that these th settings are reflected here as well, right? So the up-down settings or the pattern settings, I could change them here or here. Rates, I could change here or here. Triplets, right? Octaves, as you'd expect. And again, can be changed here. And then rhythm. which has a few options, including random. So we'll talk about deviate and mutate in a bit. Let's just go through a few more parameters. On the knobs, you've got fine tune control over right. Swing control. and gate control. Okay, we're ready for deviate and mutate. So once we turn those modes on, right? Mutate and deviate, then by default, they don't do anything because you've got to set their intensity. Okay, so let's 
Slowly mutate the pattern. The more you turn it clockwise, the crazier it'll get. And if you found a pattern you like, you can just stop turning it. And it won't change that pattern. Which is really nice because you sort of can get used to it and move on. But if you want to change it, right, this is sort of like a randomized function. And you determine the amount of craziness. Here, this obviously may be too much. Now, deviate. We'll start adding rests to the pattern, creating a rhythm. And that too you can take to extremes. really cool features of the Launch Game Mini. Now, finally, eagle-eyed viewers at home may have noticed these symbols here. I guess they're for future updates. The manual doesn't say what they do, so don't blame me if you press them and then alien invasion starts. Okay, let's remove this guy and start talking about Ableton Live integration. The biggest news is full RGB pads, which is a big improvement over Mark II, especially since you only see two rows of session cells at a time. So color is a great way to help you find your way around a project with more than two rows. Aside from that, when comparing to Mark II, we gain a lot of features, but we also lose a bit too, or maybe have a more difficult workflow. Let me explain. So if you're not familiar with Ableton Live, these two rows are reflected on screen in that sort of little outlined section on the session view. Now to access other cells, you need to move up and down or left and right. In the previous version of Launch Key, you had dedicated buttons for that. Here, the buttons that let you move around the grid are now shift functions. So to move up and down the grid, you have to hold shift up and shift down here. Right, it's these guys. And to move left and right, you need to hold shift and then move left and right here. This is how you select the active track. Now the issue I think here isn't so much that this has become a shift combo thing, though that too may be an issue, but two things. The first thing is that the shift button is over here and the arrows are over here. So if you wanted to do this with one hand, you couldn't. You sort of need to have one hand here and then use the buttons to move up and down or left and right, right? And the other hand here, both your hands are tied. Now I have an idea to solve this problem for innovation, but let me talk about the second thing. The second thing is that as you move around the grid, because shift has other functions, when you press shift, notice this is a representation of the grid. When you press shift, there are other options here, which we'll get to, but the visualization of the grid goes away. In the previous version of Launch Queue, you could see what's going on when you went up and down on the grid itself. Now, if there was a way to freeze this view for a second, say, for example, with a double tap on shift or something, then you wouldn't need two hands, right? Because you could move around with shift and you'd see what's going on on the pads. So aside from that, which hopefully can be fixed one way or another with a firmware update, in every other aspect, Launch Key Mini Mark III is a big improvement over Mark II and is probably the best controller, certainly of this size, to control Ableton Live. So let's take a look at a few of the things that have been improved in Launch Key Mini Mark III. You can configure what this bottom row does. You can use it to stop patterns, right? So if I get these guys going, I could stop clips just by pressing this and this. And this is how it used to be in Mark II but I can change the function of this row, say for example, to solo clips. I could choose to just solo this or this. The mute row to immediately mute out tracks. And then another option is just to view two rows of session view at any given time. And of course I can still scroll up and down and look at two other rows. The pads have additional functions other than looking at the session and you change that holding shift and one of these three buttons, right? So over here, we're looking at the session. Over here, we're playing drum kits. And over here, we're using a custom MIDI mapping. So drum kits is straightforward. I'll just find my 606 drum track, right? We saw that before. And then in custom mode, these pads can be configured to send any MIDI notes you want. You can figure them using Novation's components software. You can even customize their color if you like. And like I mentioned, this becomes a pretty versatile instrument when you can play one sound here and another sound here. 
two octaves here and two octaves here. So those are the three modes for the pads. The knobs have five different modes, device control, volume, pan, sends, and a custom mode as well. In device mode in Ableton Live, the knobs control the first eight parameters of whatever track you're on, right? So you move these knobs and you should see the parameters moving on screen. These are the first eight parameters. Now currently in device mode, you control the active device. If you wanna to swap to a different device in your track, you need to do that with your computer. Hopefully in the future, they'll give us a way to swap devices. I'm just saying, maybe use these bottom pads or something. It would be cool to swap devices from the keyboard itself. Next knob mode is volume controls, right? Very simply control volume, you know, levels on a per track basis in your project. I'm completely messing up the project here. Next up is pans, right? Same deal, pan, left, right. Let's mess it up. Sends work really nicely as well. When you hit sends, you have the option to pick any one of your sends. If I added more sends to this project, I'd see more sends over here. So this is sends A and sends B, right? So I can control sends like this on a per track basis, right? The first sends, and if I wanted to swap to the other ones, just go like this, add additional sends. And then in custom mode, you could map any CC, any MIDI CC you wanted to these knobs. By the way, you can even customize the MIDI function of the sustain pedal if you like using the components software. Let's take a brief look at using Launch Key Mini Mark III with an iPad. So I've got Moog's Model D app here, which is really nice. If I go into settings and MIDI, you can see that Launch Key Mini Mark III is already mapped here. And if I hit map CCs, you can see I've already mapped these three knobs to these three knobs, right? So let's just see how that works. Go into here. Resonance. And amount of contour. Laser beams. Let's say that I wanted to map this knob to the pitch of oscillator two. Just go into here, hit map CCs, hit oscillator two turn this knob, right, and that's all it needs. Let's get out of here. So let's take a look at the setup. I've got Moog's Mini Moog app, which is an excellent synth. I've got this camera connection kit with power connected to the iPad. It's being powered by this power brick, and then it's also powering and getting MIDI data from LaunchKey Mini Mark III. The pads work here as well, right? And that can be customized too. Uh, pitch pen and mod wheel, right? Map pretty nicely. So a really good standalone MIDI controller, both via USB and via MIDI. A few other odds and ends about Launch Key Mini Mark III. The manual has more information about working with other DAWs, including Logic and UE support for other DAWs like Cubase. You've got quick access with Shift Record to Ableton Live's Capture MIDI function, which is cool. You can send MIDI program change commands and change the MIDI channel with these buttons here. A nice touch that they added to Launch Key Mini Mark III is that it appears as a mounted drive when you plug it into your computer. It doesn't give you any storage or anything. It's just a handy shortcut to Novation's site. It's got a nice software bundle with all this stuff here, including Ableton Live Lite. There's a nice fixed chord function here. Right? So by default, the keyboard plays one note at a time, but you can hit fixed chord, then determine an interval, say this, and it will transpose the interval right, with any key you hit. So let's take a look at the pros and cons. On the cons side, I guess the only thing that can't be changed with a firmware update is the fact that you can't power this with an iPad or iPhone, or maybe they can come up with a low power mode. Other cons are the Ableton Live session navigation issue I mentioned before, which hopefully can be fixed in a firmware update. Regarding the build, the phrase built like a tank can't be said about this, but for the price and amount of functionality you get, I don't think anyone else is making better built hardware. My personal preference is to have two and a half or three octaves, but there's something to be said about how compact this is. And like I mentioned, the option to use these pads as two additional octaves albeit in scale, opens this up quite a bit. If you're looking for as small as possible way to control Ableton Live on the go, this is probably the best deal in town. And if you're into hardware sequencing or even wanna have a quick dollless jam with a software instrument or iPad, the arpeggiator here is refreshing and a lot of fun, especially with the mutate and deviate functions. 
Comparing this to the Mark II, if powering with an iPhone or iPad standalone isn't an issue for you, and the thing we talked about, the session view, isn't an issue either, then other than that, this is a major update to the Mark II. Having the RGB pads, which to me are critical for finding your way around the Ableton session, and all the extra features like the stop solo mute row, makes the Launch Key Mini Mark III a substantial upgrade and is well worth taking a look at. Another thing that might be well worth taking a look at is my constantly updated book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Feel free to ask me any questions in the comment section below, hit like if this was useful, and don't forget to click the notification bell after you subscribe if you don't want to miss the next one. Thanks very much for watching.